Good morning and welcome to the October Northwest of Kuho First Friday webinar. We have a great presentation today about around managing the complexity of ADA accommodations from some folks from the University of Washington. So um, I will let them introduce themselves, but first remember to pull up the group chat on the side of your screen. And if you have any questions, please just write into the chat box at any time and I will shoot them over to our presenters so they can answer them. Or just at the end, make sure to, to be chatting, chatting in every, any questions that you might have or discussion, as well as please log on to Twitter and use the handle hashtag NWChat to start conversing about this so we can bring this topic all over in our region. So um, good morning, and I will let folks take it away. Hello, my name is Bree Callahan, and I am the Director of Disability Resources for students here at the University of Washington. And my name is Jennifer Connors. I'm the Operations and Accounts Manager for Housing and Food Services here at UW. And um, Kate mentioned the chat box, and so we're going to actually take questions throughout the presentation, just make it a little bit more informal. So as we say things and as things come up, just please go ahead and type in the box and let us know, and we'll be monitor monitoring that with Kate. Um, also, it would be helpful if you all could just do a little brief introduction so we know who you are and if you're coming from a Res Life background or an Ops background or facilities or dining, just so we kind of get a, get a grip of who folks are and then kind of what you're hoping to take away. We're really just going to walk through our process here at UW and kind of talk about some of those different complexities folks deal with and, and troubleshoot various issues, um, whatever would be helpful for your time here with us this morning. Great. So we have housing ops. Well, obviously people have to type yeah. things in, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> Let's scroll to the next slide. Yeah. Um, so in terms of our process, initially um, approval for accommodations was all handled through Housing and Food Services, and so we just took it on ourselves. Students would contact us, they would request um, different accommodations, and we would work through that with them. Some of our challenges with that were that we were not experts, we are not experts on ADA, both needs of students as well as different laws, um, and we really struggled with how to best interpret some of this medical documentation. As many of you know, there's a fine line between a student preference and an actual accommodation and what that looks like, and sometimes it can be hard to assess and you go back and forth with medical providers, and we just were not in the position to be able to do that. Typically, we would always have to consult with DRS anyways, which is our disability resources for students, um, to help understand and navigate, you know, what are some of these needs? Are they typical of students? What does that look like? Our um, other challenge was we didn't actually want to store any of this medical records within our office. That's something that we very actively stay away from having. Um, so it was always an interesting um, mix of what do we do with that information once we have it, what's appropriate for record keeping, how do we document our processes, so on and so forth. So from there, we actually went to transition to having DRS manage the approval process without us. And so some of the challenges with that is they didn't essentially understand our process. While they knew the world of accommodations and disabilities and what we needed to do, they didn't understand the world of housing. And just for some additional context, we're operating um, with over 7,000 beds. We always open in autumn with a waiting list. I mean, we're crammed full of students. So our processes are very defined and outlined and consistent. And so trying to navigate some of these um, one-offs or special circumstances can get a little bit challenging, especially if you're not, that's not your day-to-day. -day. Um, DRS would often approve accommodations for something we didn't really have. So we'd say, you know, a student would come in and they would need a single room with a private bath and a private kitchen. Well, that's not something that we had at that time. It's not something we necessarily have now. It's not something accessible and available to all students. So we were stuck with this uh, situation where we were being told we had to provide something that we just didn't have in our inventory. And then sometimes the accommodations that were approved could have simply been handled by having a conversation between the roommates or some sort of a roommate agreement or involving our residential life staff to be able to just facilitate a normal conversation around conflicts or personal preferences or who gets the top bunk or the bottom bunk or whose fridge gets to go in a certain location. So we didn't, we found that we were putting a lot of effort into um, a process that maybe didn't necessarily need to happen. So where we're at now is we've actually found a balance between the, the two and it's taken many years, but it's happened. 
Um, definitely a lot of struggles along the way, a lot of difficult conversations between Bree's priority of advocating for the student, my priority of advocating for housing operations. Sometimes it flips and I'll advocate for the student and she'll advocate for housing operations, you know, getting our AGs involved when it comes to some of the more complex issues that we're dealing with now, such as um, animals and breed restrictions and those, those type of things. So um, in the end, it's definitely resulted in a really good working relationship between um, both of our offices and us. Um, and so to keep in mind, our process is always evolving. I think this is something we probably revisit the process maybe three to four times a year on a quarterly basis. How are we doing? What needs to evolve? Some of it's driven by feedback from students. Some of it's driven by feedback from us. Some of it's driven by the ADA laws that are changing or different policy recommendations that are coming, coming down. Um, some of those examples would be our um, medically related dietary restriction process has been something we've been putting a lot of effort in. Um, and we actually have what's called reservable kitchens in some of our buildings now. So we've had to develop a process for students and how they access those and what does it look like and key checkouts and agreements and cleaning and all, all of those type of things. Um, but because of the good relationships that we've established with DRS, it's really easy to have those conversations and then also facilitating all of those conversations with our different um, units across housing and food services. So the only things I would add to that, just to so you know about our living spaces, is we are not a, a freshman required housing. So I don't know if any of you have a, a requirement for on-campus housing for freshmen. That is not something the University of Washington requires. So that we do have a little more flexibility in some things that because we don't guarantee or don't require them to have on-campus housing. Those of you who are in those cases uh, might have a different experience um, or the different things you have to meet just by having that on-campus living requirement. Um, we also have nine-month contracts and 12-month contracts in family housing. Um, and we're blessed with a lot of new buildings. I know when I started here three years ago, the big master plan um, was already in progress to remodel lots of buildings on campus, which gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of the spaces that we now have versus some of the, um, I'll call them traditional living styles uh, in a residential um, hall. So there's, that's just for you guys to know uh, in terms of what we're working with on our campus. So I know those can be um, sticking points on uh, other campuses. Looks like we have some housing operations folks and some res life folks uh, on the call. So that's a great balance between the two. So before they apply, um, my, my job, which I uh, tend to see a lot of students or their parents, let's be honest, it's their parents who have questions or anxiety before. Uh, because we're a quarter system, we see a lot of folks in the springtime before fall. Um, so we're trying to manage their anxiety of their, their child going somewhere without them or the, the student just not knowing how to transition to college. So we're trying to manage how to be communicative with them um, as in an informative way as well as um, get our needs met with our deadlines because we have certain protocols as you guys do as well. Um, let's see. One of the things that we balance a lot um, is we'll see parents come in and they want to know exactly what their student can get. They, they have a predetermined idea of what they need, what things were like at home, um, and are very much kind of almost in a, a sense demanding that we give a student um, you know, a, a clean kitchen where they're the only ones that can have things and their roommate can't bring peanuts in the room and all these different types of things. And they want this information resolved immediately. And so it puts us in a challenging position because a lot of times they'll end up at housing first because that's where their questions are. And so for us, you know, my frontline staff is not always equipped to have these conversations because it's usually handle, handled by management when it comes to that type of stuff. So they talk generally about the process and options, but that's not always um, satisfactory to the parents, so they're often escalating. And then when they get to me, um, I can't tell them what they want because we haven't received any of their documentation. DRS hasn't looked at anything. I can't take a parent's word for what their doctor's actually going to say that the student needs. And so it's always a very nebulous conversation to try to talk with them about here's what our process looks like, here's what you can do, here are the range of things, um, and I'll often sit down with parents who maybe have a student who's got mobility needs, and I'll talk through, you know, as you're preparing for your conversation with Bree, 
think about, you know, how's your student going to use the bathroom? Do they need transfer chairs? Do they need grab bars? Where are those grab bars going to be at? What height? Do they need them inside the shower, outside the shower? Um, you know, how are they going to get in their door? Where are they going to store their equipment? Are they going to be able to reach the top bar in the closet? And so I'll kind of talk with them based on my knowledge of their needs and their situation, as well as my knowledge of the process and kind of say, think through these things so you can talk about them without actually giving them any sort of promise or guarantee because we know they might come in with one set of expectations regarding what their accommodation might look like. However, from our end, that accommodation may look very different. A classic example is with dining. Students will say, well, I can't eat on campus because I have a gluten allergy, so that's that. And their expectation is that they get the dining requirement waived, where for our process, that's one of the last things that we do in terms of accommodations. We have so many things that we can do um, in the interim. So it's always an interesting piece to have that conversation between um, balancing our process and guarantees, assessing their needs, and really figuring out their preferences. May I jump in? Absolutely. So the what I have, what we have found, Jen and I have found, we check in all, like every six months to make sure we're communicating um, in the best way possible. But things we found that have been very helpful in the this before they apply stage, uh, or even right at the when they apply, is if your website could be extremely informative um, of the process, that will help alleviate that anxiety and clearly outline what you're requiring of them. Um, students with disabilities. Uh, specifically, if they're incoming freshmen, they're they're most likely in school through May and June. They may not be thinking about deadlines that are actually pending in May or June um, for housing, uh, which are there for very uh, legitimate reasons for us to get assignments in place. But that's not where they're coming from. So the more you can communicate with uh, students in that early part of the process, that'll make your lives easier. And then also just having things on the web that are good resources, like virtual tours, if that's of the residential halls that you have or resources or dining facilities, um, those all can be very helpful to help alleviate any anxiety. And then lastly, I'll say that if you have or don't yet have a question about if students need disability accommodations on your, maybe not your application, but a way that you build a profile, um, gathering that information and sharing that with your disability office on campus can be very helpful. So the disability office can then reach out to the student early on if you're asking that question of them in February, March, mm -hmm. April. That'll give you more, more lead time. And so how our process works is students would apply to the University of Washington and there's an opportunity for them on their acceptance form to self-disclose that they need accommodations or they have a disability and what that looks like. And that information goes um, directly to Bree's office and then she'll reach out and connect with those students. We do something similar on the housing end where, with what Bree mentioned, we have a profile set up where a student can indicate that they're going to be seeking housing accommodations and then we will proactively reach out to them um, with an email referring them to Bree's office. And then throughout the year, we will do um, various audits where I'll just send her a list of here's all the students who checked yes, cross-reference them with the students on your list and see who we're missing because we find um, Every year, inevitably, there's a student who has some major facility needs um, who doesn't tell us until maybe move in or a few days before. So we're trying to do everything that we can do to try to catch those students. But ultimately, with both of our processes, it's really based on self-disclosure. So that's a limitation. Um, so for our housing process, it's very independent of the actual DRS process. So they, they work in conjunction with each other. Um, students who go through our housing process are treated just like any other student. They don't have a higher priority for housing. We don't let them in first. Um, we do work with them once they meet our deadline, especially to make sure they're getting assigned to a space that meets their needs. Um, so it becomes a little gray in that sense, but we don't essentially assign them there until it's their turn to be assigned, if you will. Um, the only exception to that is through our family housing process that we run where students um, can actually get placed in the highest priority category because of a disability just due to the limited availability of ADA apartments within our um, university district in Seattle as a whole. Um, and then our application deadline is the same as any other student, so we don't take late requests. They need to be able to meet our deadlines in order to receive guaranteed housing or housing, and we often um, have many students with disabilities who end up getting put on our wait list because they weren't able to meet those deadlines. So once a student uh, completes the housing application process, which they could do in parallel to the disability uh, services process or before, I mean, ideally they've done the housing one first, 
Um, but once they connect with my office, we're doing uh, our information gathering and our process to evaluate what's an approved accommodation um, and make it very clear to the student that this is separate than anything academic. I don't know if there's anybody who works with their disability office on the line, um, but those offices ideally would be having a separate conversation with academics versus housing to make sure it's uh, clear um, which process they're in because it could be very different. HFS here, Housing for Services, sets the deadline for how they need to do assignments and any kind of facility modifications, and we just encourage students um, to follow those. Uh, we always warn them if they don't turn something in by the deadline, right, there could be a wait list, which is, uh, I think, almost an annual reality uh, as we're growing here in terms of the popularity for on-campus um, housing. So our deadlines are set up uh, by their t the type of student, um, a returning resident, somebody who's living with with HFS um, and is just returning versus a new applicant by quarter. Um, and that's, that, that's set up based off how Jen has determined assignments um, need to be determined in that, in that workflow. Yeah, and our dates, they've, they've changed over the years. Um, and the major, major driver behind our dates is if we needed to retrofit a unit to make it wheelchair accessible, how long would it take us? And that's kind of the basis for um, guiding some of these. And so, for example, our 12-month apartment returning resident deadline is March 1st. That's really early, and it might even be before somebody even applies to 12-month apartments. And that's because those are occupied all year round, so we need to be able to pull it offline. We need to work with our facilities to ensure that the unit that we're picking is um, if it needs to have an automatic door panel associated with it, we need to make sure it's in close proximity to um, the electrical closets because of wiring issues and all the different dynamics. And so there's a lot of different pieces to think about, um, as well as, you know, we do kind of this assessment for each of our buildings to figure out where's the best spot for this student. And that takes, as you all know, quite a bit of time. So that, for us, is a really early deadline, and we've needed all of that time before. Um, so that's kind of what drives the first level um, of our deadlines. And then the second level is when do we start our assignment process and what does that look like for all students. So for our new applicant deadline, you can see um, they need to have all of their paperwork into DRS, and DRS has to tell me about that by June 15th. And that's because we're going to start assigning um, all of our students about two weeks later. And so we need to make sure we've got ample time to assign students to single rooms with bathrooms and, and work through all of those different pieces as well as, again, make sure we can get our facilities and electrical work um, on the books if that's something that we need to do. Um, we often have students who don't meet the deadlines, and that's always Imagine a question that. is, yeah. what happens when <laughs> I don't meet the deadline? Um, so we will do our best to accommodate a student at every point that we can. However, there are some times where we have to accommodate a student. For example, a life safety issue. Um, this year we've actually had a few students who um, needed visual fire alerts that we didn't know about until the very last minute. We had to actively move students and, and make some arrangements, which um, caused a pretty big impact. And then we've got other students where maybe their accommodation um, need is just a dining consult through our MRDR process. It's really easy to be able to accommodate that after the deadline. So it really depends on what the situation is, what's going on, what our availability is. Um, but ultimately, if somebody doesn't meet our deadlines, then we say, you might have to deal with it for a quarter. Here's all of the different support resources we have. We connect them with DRS. We connect them with um, our residential life folks, and we do whatever we can do to support them through, through the first quarter, knowing that they might not be able to get their single room until winter quarter. So what does that look like for them? And so we'll do some planning, and then as soon as we can um, meet that need, we will. Um, but we really stick to these deadlines. So we make sure that they're published every year, make sure students understand them, um, and then they're also communicated from the DRS end of things. Something new that Jen and I are going to try this year is writing a report um, with, within my office so I can share with her who has a disability that's connected to my office and then she can cross-reference uh, it within who's in housing, even if they haven't made a request. And that's come up for these life safety things where a student who is deaf or hard of hearing or wears cochlear implants who literally can't hear the fire alarm, but they don't think to make that request. Uh, for a visual fire alert, just uh, they're not they're not used to that in their in their housing, perhaps at home. Um, their parents have always been there, or there's no fire alarm in the in the actual home. So 
at least in the same capacity. So there's, we're having to kind of be creative as, as a way to help solve our operational challenge in terms of uh, addressing some of those things that come up after that deadline, simply because the students don't think about making an accommodation request. And we also need to get pretty creative when it comes to temporary or unexpected situations, such as the student who breaks their leg prior to opening and then comes in and they happen to be assigned to an apartment that's only accessible via stairs, things like that. Um, so we work together to really figure out what does the student need, what are the best options, because sometimes our housing availability is really going to drive um, what type of spaces we have available for those students. And, and typically through our, our process, we'll have a bunch of different options for a student. We'll sit down with them and say, you know, here's your situation, here are your needs, here are these five spaces that meet your need, here are the pros and cons of each of those spaces, and then we let them make the decision about what works for them best, what they think that they need. Um, so it's very much a partnership conversation between all folks involved. Um, so we have a question. Yeah, so we have one question that's um, asked about what we do to check in with students throughout the year. We're actually going to get to that. Um, what's the other one? Uh, well, it's more of a comment, but it's about the fire um, alarm strobes, how they've had challenges with that. Mm -hmm. I just thought we'd share perhaps, uh, I don't know on your campus what your equipment would be, but our one option we have pursued with some students who actually can hear the fire alarm um, at the at the decimal that it um, uh, goes off at. Um, so there's been a few times where we've it does require the building to be vacant because you have to actually turn the fire alarm and actually test to make sure they can hear it. But if there's a, a time where a student is adamant about staying in a room and that they can't actually hear the alarm, we have done an actual test with our environmental health and safety unit um, who would, would be, kind of be the one to make the, the call on that one where the, we literally put the student in the uh, residents and have them turn around and give us a signal when they can hear something um, and we test them in different rooms. So there have been sometimes we've creatively allowed a student to stay in the room once we can verify they're going to hear um, that an emergency um, alarm going off. So there could be something similar like that perhaps in your campuses to help versus just relocating everybody. Yeah and um, with um, visual fire alerts specifically we've had some interesting process changes over the past years. Our um, formal accommodation used to be requiring that students had a doorbell attached to a bed shaker in their room and it attaches to this contraption that's like an alarm clock and you can plug in a light and it flashes and it's got this smoke detector looking thing that you put under your mattress on this cardboard and it shakes your bed whenever anybody um, outside in the hall rings the doorbell. And so that was connected to our, our fire evacuation practices in that the fire alarm would go off, the RA as they're leaving the hall would press the button to ring the doorbell of the student's room to alert them that there was um, a need to evacuate the building and then everybody would leave. So there are a lot of concerns with that set <laughs> process. First and foremost, you know, it's not the RA's responsibility to be doing that. What if the RA is not around? Um, we had a lot of students complain because we had some pranksters who would see this doorbell in a student's room and they would just go through you know, when they're getting home maybe late at night, they'd ring the doorbell at 2, 3, 4 in the morning, waking the student up. So then um, they would be really frustrated about um, that. Then there was also this uh, essential, essentially this visual notification hanging outside their door saying, hey, somebody in here has a disability, and they didn't like um, that level of disclosure. So we sat down with um, a couple of our students who gave us some really critical feedback about what their needs were, what they liked about our process, what they didn't like about our process, and we ended up evolving it to um, you know, allowing them to bring their own contraption if they want. They didn't need to use ours. We didn't require it. We didn't make them paste this awkward doorbell outside their room, um, but we did make sure that they're in a room with a visual alert, and that was ultimately what we could do to help them is we made sure the space was fit to be able to support their safety needs. If they had additional concerns on top of that, they could address that. Um, and it's worked great and we haven't had any problems. Um, we also find that students specifically with um, hearing impairments don't want to be labeled and don't want to feel like they need housing accommodations, which is why they're not telling us until later, which then is frustrating for everybody because then we have to move them because we, you know, for safety reasons, cannot allow them to be in a room that doesn't have this visual fire alert unless um, they pass the hearing test that Brie mentioned. So, so that's been an interesting one. Someone says, yes, yeah. this is my experience as well. <laughs> yes, <laughs> commiserate together. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so in terms of our process, 
um, what it looks like. So we have this little chart, and it is not nearly as large on my screen as it might be on yours. Um, our flow chart of what our process looks like. And so really it starts with students um, getting admission, self-disclosing that they need um, accommodations, and then HFS kicks off the process back to the student, sending the student to DRS. So it's always kind of a nebulous enter in, entrance point. They could come in at the university level, they could come in at the DRS level, they could come in at our level. Um, DRS reviews the information, it's always that conversation back and forth with housing. And um, what I really appreciate Bree does all the time is the minute she gets um, an accommodation request, she always picks up the phone and calls me says, is the student on your radar yet? Here's what's happening. I'm waiting on their paperwork, but just so you know, they're gonna need a roll-in shower. They're gonna need um, a private bath. They're gonna have a personal care attendant. Keep that on your radar. And so that's been really helpful for me because then I can be mentally planning, knowing what's coming. And it gives the student a little bit more flexibility in terms of the deadlines, <coughs> honestly, just because I know we're just waiting on some documentation from the medical provider, but this is probably what it's gonna look like. So it's very helpful. Um, and then by the time our formal documentation of here's your actual approved accommodation comes into place, um, we're already on the same page of what that looks like and where that student might go. Um, so then DRS, once everything is reviewed, um, will actually contact the student and let them know what their accommodations are. Yes. So what, and this has actually been an evolution for, um, for me in the, the three years that I've been at the University of Washington, and, and for those I didn't mention before, I am the point person for housing um, for the disability office within, uh, so I don't have any of my other staff manage it. That just has been easier to have one person be the point person for housing. Um, that may not be possible at other campuses, but so I have a, a survey that students have to complete uh, that will give me some details um, before they actually can uh, well, before they, they talk to me in a more thorough basis. Um, and sometimes that survey is plenty and that, that I need and that I can just move forward really quickly um, for housing. So they have to answer questions around, do you, need, do you require physical modifications? If so, are we talking grab bars and showers? Are we talking um, uh, door paddles? If you're gonna have a, a service animal or a therapy animal, um, what's the breed? Is it already vaccinated? Do you have the vaccination report? If you have a personal care attendant, um, is, it, is it a student, is it somebody outside? So I ask them a series of questions um, to get that information. So when I'm looking at it for the first time, uh, that'll get me more, more context to move very quickly and in, in Jen's point, call her in case there's something there that, that, that comes up. Um, and we actually forward. worked on developing the, that questionnaire together based on what are the things housing typically sees, how do we usually accommodate them, and kind of worked backwards to say, let's get that information on the front end. Because the first year of this process, um, when Bree and I were both new and doing it together, she'd say, hey, we need this. And I'd be like, well, what about their mailbox? Can the student use a key? Does it have to be at a certain height? How are they going to get their packages? And kind of ask all these questions. And she was always like, what are you talking about? Why are you asking me this stuff? <laughs> so we decided to actually ask that on the survey so then we could start to get a better idea. And it was just less back and forth. And it's so much easier for us. So um, it was really helpful to do that together. I think. It's also very educational for the students. I mean, I've those are the call my experiences, or at least my my peer group. Uh, freshmen don't have any clue about what they're going to come and live in the space, nor do their parents, honestly. So having to ask them questions about the mailbox or about uh, grab bars and showers, it, it helps them understand what they're walking into and how to best answer some of these questions. Um, and we've learned that asking them more up front, and that it might be a more thorough questionnaire, uh, but it does get us down the path sooner, so we run into less bumps. Um, operationally for any, especially specifically for any kind of modifications needed to be in place for facilities. So once I approve the accommodation, it goes um, to Jen and to the assignment process and um, they, she can speak more to it, but the accommodation is there and in place either on a temporary basis, if it's a temporary condition, or only for the year based off what I've uh, got from the healthcare provider, or is there on a, on a permanent basis? And so that's a part of how they assign, but they still would take into uh, the process any preferences they may have. Um, so it's done, and those things can happen um, collectively in the assignment process. Um, so in terms of some of our major accommodation needs, we've talked about some of the more um, permanent facility modifications that might happen. Um, we also look at an accommodation of removing and storing furniture. Normally, all of our students have to keep every furniture piece in their room, um, but sometimes we need to make space for a student who maybe has 
a power wheelchair and a manual wheelchair, and they need extra space to be able to store their equipment in their room. So we'll do different things like that, or students who uh, maybe needed to bring in a special bed or exercise equipment to work on um, various physical therapy pieces that they need. Um, so that's something we coordinate with our facility staff to do um, any of those temporary or permanent modifications. Um, we'll have different assignment accommodation needs, including being assigned with only one roommate, having access to the private bathroom. Sometimes it's having access to a bathroom where there are multiple stalls because maybe they need to be in the bathroom for um, a long period of time frequently throughout the day. Um, or maybe they need to be in a private space where they can change some of their equipment and things like that. Um, we also automatically approve all of our students with disabilities um, for early arrival housing so they can come onto campus early and get situated. Um, they still have to pay for it just like any other student would, but we just approve it knowing that sometimes it takes them a little bit longer to get acclimated on campus or to help um, address some of the anxiety that might come up along with finding their classes, things like that. They still have to they still apply, apply. yeah. yeah. Um, and then sometimes we will do rate adjustments. Um, so if we have a student who's required or their accommodation is to be in a single room, um, since it's not necessarily their fault that they need to be in a single room, we will automatically adjust that rate of that room to that of a double room. Um, and so that depends on what side of campus and depending on their type of single, that's where some of that conversation with the student comes in of what side of campus do you want to be on, what are your preferences, you know, here's what meets your base accommodation, here's what else we have available, and they'll kind of pick through what might work for them based on their preferences and their budget. Um, those are all of those. Um, we will also do um, campus visits and meetings. Those usually come with um, major facility modifications where um, our interior designer and our maintenance crew will actually invite a student to campus um, to walk through the room with them to talk through all of those different, you know, how are you going to get into the room? How are you going to maneuver into the bathroom? How are you going to get into the shower? And they'll actually um, do that with them in early June so then we can make sure we're getting the modifications correct. The one thing would be the res life connection in terms of when they get closer to move in, but having the residential director or even the RA know um, there might be a need to have a conversation with roommates. That This could happen with somebody on the spectrum, the autism spectrum, uh, potentially, um, if, they're, if they're choosing to live with a, with a roommate, or if there's an animal potentially involved, uh, or just other, other things that could come up. So we do have an accommodation where I just inform res life that a, a conversation may need to be had between the roommates, or at least to it, get involved very quickly if they can. The other one is uh, the list for the emergency evac. So we actually put a, a few different types of disabilities on the emergency evacuation list per building. Uh, traditionally, the mobility uh, students, if they you know, use a walker, cane, um, or are a wheelchair user, uh, if they're deaf and hard of hearing. Um, but we've actually started also putting students on the autism spectrum on this list. There's a lot, as the research is kind of growing on this population, they can get really overstimulated with lights flashing, lots of people moving in hallways, uh, and they may become paralyzed and have to just stay in one space. So um, we've begun putting all of them on the emergency evacuation list as well, um, not for mobility reasons, but for other reasons. Mm -hmm. And we also put on students who do have um, service or therapy animals, not because we are legally required to do anything about that, but just so it's an awareness piece that there might be an animal with somebody, or if you know a student is having a really hard time during a drill because maybe their cat's still in their room. It's just something that we want everybody to be aware of. Um, and then we also work with our desk services to address um, key and building access issues is something that we have, whether they need a keyless entry, um, access for personal care attendance, which is always a complex issue because we find some of our students will have more permanent um, PCAs, but then sometimes what happens if that PCA calls in sick and then the agency sends somebody else and we don't have them on our um, roster of people who should get access and so that's always kind of, that's a piece of our process we're still working through, um, trying to figure out what the best way to approach that is so the caregivers can get access um, when they need it. We've done special things with uh, mail and package delivery. Um, we get, I think this year for opening, I think we're already at 6,000 packages in a week, oh my um, wow. and that was just that move-in. It's, it's insane, and, but we find that, you know, if a student's in a chair, 
than their ability to come wait in a line, pick up their package, wheel their package, because our, our campus is kind of set up more neighborhood-based. So you might need to cross a divided highway to get back to your building. And so working through some of those is issues to figure out what, what's the best way for students to be able to get items like that. Um, you know, mailbox keys are really hard to navigate depending on what level your mailbox is. Sometimes we've actually had to physically move the box so students could um, key into there a little bit easier or we'll just collect their mail and hand deliver at the desk um, are some of the different things that we do on that end. Um, I think those are most of the major accommodations that we tend to see or that we work with on the housing um, side of things. Yeah. In terms of our assignment process, just a few other pieces to touch on. Um, we do, we have um, started a roommate notification process specifically with animals um, because we've had a lot of different issues with students being allergic, students being afraid, students from different countries not really understanding why this needs to happen and it causing a lot of conflict later. So one of the pieces that we've been doing is anytime a student has been approved to have an animal in the room, we will reach out to the roommates proactively and say, hey, this accommodation has been approved, here's the type of animal, do you have any concerns about this? If so, let us know. And then if they do, we'll kind of work with all parties invested to figure out who, who's gonna move, because you can't have students live together if somebody's got a dog and somebody has an allergy to a dog and it really just comes down to what other spaces are available what makes the most sense. Sometimes we move the student with the accommodation, sometimes we've moved the roommate. Um, thankfully, it's always kind of worked out because everybody's really understanding about wanting everybody to feel safe in their space. Um, this year, we also had um, a more non-traditional animal, if you will, come live with us that we in our housing office were a little afraid of. <laughs> um, so we made sure to reach out to the students to say, hey, just so you know, there's, there's a therapy rat in your room. Let's talk about this, um, just in case they were afraid of that. And so, you know, we would um, make sure that everybody is really comfortable with the situation. Other than that, we don't do any sort of notification. We don't even, and even with animals, we don't disclose whether it's a therapy animal, whether, um, you know, a student's bringing in a service animal, those type of things. We really just say, this is happening. Let's have a conversation about um, how this might impact you as well. Let me get into dining. Uh which is just as exciting. Um, and uh, those of you who may be aware of the, the famous Leslie case, uh, that has definitely been um, causing our campus to relook at how we approach dining. But again, we are also not a freshman required um, housing um, campus. So we do have more flexibility in what we do versus I, uh, as I understand those who ha actually require freshmen to um, live on campus. So if you're in one of those groups, you might have more work to do on that one. But essentially what, what I do is, is the same process. I approve the accommodation. In this case, it's the, uh, a dining consult uh, for a student where they will then meet with um, a dining administrator, uh, the, if not the executive chef, one of the chefs uh, in, the, in the region that they'll be living because um, we have a large campus. Um, that way they know the chef of the space they'll be most likely eating out on a regular basis. Um, and had that personal connection. The chef will then probably walk them through the um, <clears throat> the eating space and meet other sous chefs or line chefs and staff. And that, that's designed to make the student more comfortable. Um, in the case we're approving this, it's somebody who literally has a life-threatening food allergy. Um, so they're scared to eat something and, and have to go to the hospital or inject themselves with EpiPen. It's truly a life or death situation. So we're trying to find a way to make it um, feel as comfortable um, and have them connected to the staff preparing their food as possible, uh, just because we don't want anyone to have that extreme reaction just by having food on campus with us. So they have a consult, um, and then based off how that goes, uh, and they learn how to eat safely, um, or if they can't eat safely, other, other avenues, whether we order food for them, um, specifically or we store food, or they use the reservable kitchen, potentially, that Jed mentioned earlier in their, um, in their building or at a uh, building right next door, um, that gets sorted out within the dining staff consultation um, at that point. And one of my favorite things that our staff will do is um, the chefs and managers will send students menus out like three weeks at a time saying, here at your local dining facility, here's what we're serving. They'll highlight and circle the options that work for them and their diet. And if you as a student aren't interested, let's say you don't want to eat, um, you know, mushroom soup or whatever it is, you can just respond back and be like, I don't like this, can I have this instead? And they will actually specially make students those meals. So it's just more about 
um, planning and being proactive, um, but they're very accommodating and really want students to have a good experience. And they also want them to be able to eat those meals in our communal dining space because you know how important it is to be able to eat with your friends in your building and, and how we value that in terms of community building. Um, so our dining staff, they don't want to just send a student off with a meal to eat secluded in their room. They still want them to be included in the space. Um, so this year we've got a, a meal prep area in one of our facilities where a student can take um, a meal specially prepared for them that's allergen sensitive, take it to this special area in our dining facility where they can reheat it, they can add spices if they want, they can do whatever kind of prep they need and then they can take it and go sit with their friends at a table. Um, so we'll do some different things like that. Um, all of our different equipment is labeled and how we store items. Um, purple is our gluten sensitive storage container of choice. So um, our dining staff has all of the different shelving specifically taped off and lined and color coded to make sure you know you don't keep gluten flour located on a shelf above non-gluten flour so then it doesn't contaminate it. So they're very sensitive to, to cross-contamination issues and things like that. And so that's constantly evolving, but we've made a lot of um, really great progress in there. If a student wants to bring their own items, we will give them a plastic tub, we'll put their name on it, we'll save them space in our, um, in our storage facilities or in our walk-in kitchen or walk-in uh, refrigerators and then dining staff will assist them in getting that um, if they need it too. We'll do special ordering for them, all sorts of different things. Um, the very, very last thing that we ever go to is waiving or reducing the dining requirement since it is a fundamental component of our program. Um, but hopefully that gives you an idea of um, things that we could do up into the interim to be able to help support students without needing to, to waive that. If anybody's on the call who works with dining, there is a Serve Safe training for allergens that, have, that has come out now, and I'd recommend people take a look at that if they haven't yet looked at how to serve. And we're also looking at how you, your, your language of gluten-free versus gluten-sensitive is something to be mindful of. When you say gluten-free, there's a certain expectation of that, and we've gone the route of uh, we have to make sure that we receive something gluten-free from the vendor. We've gotten really particular about when it actually is gluten-free uh, versus when it's gluten-sensitive. Uh, our chefs are of the mindset where if it's prepped here in our space, we cannot guarantee gluten-free because there's so many variables in play. So we're only saying things are gluten-free if it's something that has come from Bob Red Mill, for example, um, or other places that um, it's packaged and delivered to us in that space. So things to be mindful of. Um, so moving in, we've talked a lot about some of our prep. Um, and on this one, I just wanted to touch on once a student actually moves in, their needs might change or they might realize, oh, I do need this grab bar or this space isn't going to work or this community kitchen isn't going to work. And so one of the questions was, you know, how do we work with students to continue making sure that their accommodation needs get met? We find that this is one of the biggest times that it's important to have staff available with the capacity to address some of these issues as they come up. Um, and that is to kind of catch, because, you know, we're all busy folks and sometimes we might forget about, um, you know, adjusting the mailbox and then all of a sudden it comes up and trying to figure out some of that stuff. So we definitely do a lot of problem solving and adjusting um, as the students moving in, which is also nice uh, when they do come early because then it gives us a couple extra days to do that. Um, but either way, we have a really good relationship with our facility staff to be able to um, navigate those problems um, and challenges as they, as they happen. So then once a student is actually in here during residency is another time um, when we kind of check in with them. And so we don't typically reach out to students to check in to see how they're doing. Um, most of the students that um, have accommodation needs know me personally as sort of the face of the person who's going to help them with everything. Um, so one of my things that I try to do is really get them, you know, directly working with their custodial supervisor, directly working with their dining manager, directly working with their resident director so everything doesn't necessarily get funneled through me. We've had mixed success with that, but generally speaking, I know almost all of our students um, by name, I know what they need, and so then they can easily come to me and say, hey, this isn't working, or, um, you know, we had a student who was having a difficult time opening their door and they had done what students do and they took this weird bungee cord contraption that they made out of their tights and tied this door open and I actually called Kate and I was like, Kate, this is not okay. And Kate was like, this is not okay. And we fixed it. <laughs> um, so we always have things like that that come up or um, 
different times when we're doing maintenance in our buildings, if we get, if we know that there's fire alarm testing, we'll specifically reach out with stu to students to let them know of that. Um, if we've got plastic, this came up one year, we had plastic laid down because we were working on the fire panel and it was getting caught in a student's wheelchair. So we would make sure that that gets moved. So there's always def different troubleshooting. And so my focus is really trying to help empower the student to let them know that if it seems off or it seems weird or it's, if it's not easy for them, that's a problem and we wanna know about it so we can address it. We had a question, um, University of Washington, how many students participate in your dining requirements meal plan? Um, off the cuff, we have probably 6,500 required dining plans. So we have most of our spaces are required dining in our, our nine month area. And then we do have some apartment style in our studios that are dining optional. But roughly speaking, we've got 6,500 required dining plans and then probably another thousand students who have the opportunity to opt in or out. Um, that's real rough. I should probably know that number off the top of my head, but I don't. Um, in terms of waiving a dining account in a required area, we have done it once in four years. So to help you all understand, we, we don't go there. And even that was a big negotiation and we tried to, to reduce before we actually went to that level. So. And we only have, I'd say, probably, um, I mean, of the 80 students, I think, that we work with on a regular basis every year right now, I think about a third of them um, have uh, some sort of dining component. So we're still talking under 30 mm -hmm. students of yeah. that 6,500. Yeah. Um, can you go to the next slide? Um, so in terms of... Um, Preparing to return. So we've got students who are living with us. We're adjusting their needs as they come up. One thing that we often find that comes up mid-year is the animal piece. And I don't know if it's a change in therapy plan. Students have tried different um, approaches. It's not worked. Now they're going to this level. But that's our most common one that comes up throughout the year or the dining. Um, and then from there it would be a temporary um, situation where a student broke something and then we need to work with them on that or um, they had a medical procedure and now they're recovering from surgery and so they need some special things around that. Um, so again, we will work through those, but again, it's the student's responsibility to really bring that to our attention. I would say most of the conversations we do are for that first, first year student, whether it's a first year transfer, first year freshman, but yeah. then once they get to the current stage, they can pick their own space. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so for our process, once we will assign students for their first year, but then once they decide to return with us for a second year, they get to pick their own room. And so we, this is probably one of the areas that we're not the best at in terms of working through this and an area for improvement is really helping students with different accommodation needs understand what spaces can they live in, um, what areas might work for them, and then how do we help get them in there. Um, it often comes up with students who maybe we make a lot of modifications to their room um, for mobility issues or door access issues, and some of them just really want to stay put and they love their room. Other students want to be able to go and move into an apartment and kind of have that next sophomore or junior um, experience. And so we work with them pretty um, individually and send out various communications, letting them know if they want to move to a different room, then they would contact me specifically um, and we would work with them through, through that process and try to get them situated um, or at least talk with them, you know, when they go into our room self-selection, what type of room should we look for? And then we'll always do audits to make sure that they all landed in spaces that, that work for them. So it's a very kind of manual, hands-on process um, and usually has to involve a conversation because, again, they don't, they don't know what type of spaces we have available and we have so many different um, nuances to our system and so it's um, those are some of the most fun conversations I think I get to have in terms of you know really hearing from a student you know what do you want your experience to be like what did you enjoy about this year what do you want next year to look like um, and really helping empower them and helping them understand that they do have choices and they can live somewhere different um, but also balancing that with you know our facility and operational needs in terms of um, modifications and so maybe they want to move to a certain building However, once they're in that building, they're limited to some rooms that we've already retrofit or something like that. And then the last piece of kind of their life cycle is what happens when they vacate. Um, and so we track um, specifically um, 
animals in our system. And so we have a, a system set up where our facility staff can run uh, a report out of our, um, our occupancy management software. They can run a report regularly to identify what spaces have had animals, so then we can schedule the flea treatment and um, pest treatment and clean those specifically, which is always a very tight turnaround, especially when we have conferences moving in maybe the next day. So we um, plan very um, carefully with those spaces to make sure that they get the treatment that they need, but it's something that our facility staff can do independent of me. Um, we also still have a hard deadline to vacate. So when a contract is, when a student's contract is done, their contract is done, we don't do any sort of late checkout like we would do an early arrival. Um, they need to be out when every other student needs to be out because we are turning our building so fast that we just don't have the flexibility to allow for that. And then we find that students, you know, as in every other school, they'll kind of trickle out throughout the week. So the move in process is, or the move out process isn't nearly as hectic as the move in process. Plus, they have a year of navigating campus under their belt. They know what's going on. They know the routines. It's much easier for them to figure it out. Um, so we don't offer any flexibility on, on that end. Um, and then I work with facilities to specifically alert them of any modifications that were made that need to be reverted back to their original room type. So for example, if we converted a double room to a single, or we removed furniture, or we added some extra furniture, whatnot, um, I'll send a list to our facilities so they can make sure those spaces get reset um, for the next occupant. So that's kind of the brief overview of um, our life cycle. And so um, if we've got about five minutes left, so we have this last slide. But if you guys all have questions, please start um, shooting them in the, the chat log and we'll address what we can shortly. I'd say the our important factors of success uh, have definitely been a clearly defined process is uh, one of our main key pieces. Uh, so we, as in Jen and I, HFS and DRS, have had to really sit down and talk about how our processes are separate and then where they intersect. So that's been good in operationally for us internally, but then how to clearly explain that to um, specifically parents and freshmen um, are the main folks that we think about because they're the ones who are least familiar with the system and the process. So using uh, the website or other tools or resources you have within um, your structures uh, that make life easier for you, but also can communicate it uh, to that audience um, will make it very successful for you. We take an approach here at the University of Washington. Um, there is the ADA code, they have the, the building code, and there's also how usable is the space. So there's been often times where things have been built to code, but are not usable. So the, the conversation with our facilities office and uh, as we're building new um, buildings and, and the architect's firm and people working on that, that, try to have things be more usable in terms of a space versus just to code. It keeps us from having to do a lot of re retrofitting or things that need to be modified on the end. So if there's a way to encourage that, that more uh, friendly concept versus just the, the strict legal code, that is a, can be a, a huge factor to success. And then the, the piece of follow-up, we... I'm trying to incorporate in my office more often, like especially with freshmen, you know, after the first six weeks or eight weeks of school, check in and see how things are going, both for academics but also in the housing situation. We have, the majority of our students have housing and academic accommodations, so they're working with my office already, but there's a small percentage that only have housing accommodations. So um, I would say it's under 20 that have just housing only, and those typically are the ones with medical dietary restrictions. Um, or have very minimal needs. Um, so those tend to be pretty straightforward. It's the other ones that we will see on a regular basis in our academic realm in the uh, disability office. Another great tool that I'm gonna give Jen complete credit for is our use of SharePoint as a workflow between our two offices. Uh, it's been a really easy way uh, to communicate things and also allows us to communicate with dining and facilities and rest life um, in one um, software program has made it really fantastic. Uh, it's become highly effective <laughs> using just that. Um, so that's all we have. I think Kate's got some words of wisdom on behalf of Northwest Ikuho. Um And if there are any other questions, we've got a few minutes and Bree and I are more than happy to stay on the line to, to chat with folks. And then um, our email and phone number is up on the screen now. So please feel free to to take this information and continue the conversation. Um, we, we enjoy connecting with people. Um, if anybody needs to bring us to your campus to, to consult, we, uh, we like to travel. Yeah. <laughs> travel. Yeah. Don't get to very often, but be happy to talk about that further. 
Thank you so much, Jen and Bree. That was really tremendous. And um, so I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning. So Kate Flowers, I'm the Professional Development Committee Chair here at Northwest Akuho, and I have the pleasure of working with both of them. Bree, not always, sadly, as often. We can work on but that. But Jen, we can work on that. Um, and they have just done an absolutely tremendous job here on campus and are actually brilliant at, at identifying what other things can be learned and learned from and continue to grow. So I think please reach out to collaborate because um, this is something that's ever evolving and it's always best if we're able to collaborate from institution to institution. So we have um, come to a close here. So thank you so much for signing on. And our November First Friday webinar is going to be out about resident eco movement from um, a colleague at the University of Calgary. So um, please join us then and please look out in your email for a thank you email for coming where you can give us some feedback about your webinar experience and the presenters some kudos or some thoughts to consider. But um, thank you so much and we look forward to seeing you next month. Have a great Friday.